Welcome to the Edge Dwellers Cafe, an interview-based podcast featuring conversations at the convergence of politics, environment and mental health in a world on edge. My name is Ben Habib and I'm an international relations scholar, an environmentalist, permaculture practitioner and neurodivergent coffee drinker. Join me in my quest to explore the edges that define us, divide us, and shape how we interact with each other as we grapple with the extraordinary changes taking place across our world. Order a hot beverage and get comfortable. This is the Edge Dwellers Cafe. Greetings, Edge Dwellers. There's an emerging field in international relations called First Nations diplomacies. Although it's only emerging in the sense that it's gaining recognition in academia, when in reality it's based on tens of thousands of years of knowledge and practice, far outdating today's international system. Worldviews and practices of these First Nations diplomacies challenge us to imagine what it might be like to think beyond state borders and to think beyond the norms of the prevailing international system. And to think about how to share power with First Nations peoples and to move into relationship with the earth, rather than subjugating both to the ultimate detriment of all. In this episode, I'm joined by James Blackwell, Research Fellow in Indigenous Diplomacy in the College of Asia and the Pacific at Australian National University in Canberra. A proud Wiradjuri man, James is one of Australia's only practising Aboriginal international relations academics writing and speaking about global Indigenous movements, US electoral politics, and defence policy. Outside of international relations, James is an Indigenous public policy researcher specialising in Australian First Nations constitutional reform, higher education policy, and racial cultural competency in practice. He's also a member of the Uluru Dialogue out of the University of New South Wales, supporting the implementation of the Uluru Statement and a Voice to Parliament. In our discussion to follow, we get into First Nations participation and representation in the international relations discipline and the inclusion of First Nations perspectives in the IR curriculum. James explains his work on First Nations diplomacies and relationality in Indigenous governance systems and what it means to be of country. We explore the Uluru Dialogue and the logic of the voice treaty truth sequence of implementing the Uluru Statement from the Heart. And we also talk media, decolonizing the university, indigenous language reclamation, US politics, and AUKUS and those damn submarines. A couple of things, though, before I cut to my chat with James. First, apologies for the audio on my side of the chat, which you'll notice is a little maxed out. I used a new microphone for this recording, and despite the testing I did beforehand, I still had the gain a little too high. It's a lot of fun learning how to use these new toys, but I confess I'm still a technical noob, so apologies for the sound quality. Quick plug for my new tip jar on Ko-Fi. As you'll remember from previous episodes, I'm accepting small financial contributions to help cover the production costs of the Edge Dwellers Cafe. After flirting with Patreon and PayPal, I've decided to go with Ko-Fi for this purpose. I think its functionality is better both at your end and at my end, hence the switch. You can find the link to my Ko-Fi page in the show notes and at the top of the main Edge Dwellers Cafe page, where you can make a one-off or ongoing monthly contribution of any amount. Now, this isn't big capitalism. All contributions go towards offsetting the cost of researching, hosting, editing, and equipment for the podcast. So if you like what you're hearing at the Edge Dwellers Cafe, please consider leaving a tip. Any and all contributions are greatly appreciated. Okay, that's the business side out of the way. Now, please enjoy my conversation with James Blackwell. The Edge Dwellers Cafe. James Blackwell, welcome to the Edge Dwellers Cafe. Thanks for having me. Really good to be here. Just to start off, I'd I'd love to ask you about your career trajectory. So, First of all, you're in your first week now of of your PhD candidature at Australian National University, but you've 
had a, an interesting pathway finding international relations. And I think everyone who ends up in IR usually has some kind of interesting pathway or trajectory to get there. So do you want to tell us a little bit about yours? Yeah, I mean, you know, you're right. No one ends up in IR in a, in a direct route. We all can end up here in a real weird, circuitous journey. It's a bit like, you know, the Lord of the Rings is not direct. You're going to end up, end up going to Mordor and back before you end up here. Yeah, so I kind of started off in my undergrad degree doing a more economics finance focused undergrad and worked for a couple of years during that and after that at a credit rating firm uh, for, for Moody's for a couple of years, which was, you know, inter- you know interesting stuff, but not, not necessarily, I think, what, what I wanted to be doing with my career long term. Like it was good work and good pay and really interesting, you know, working on state government credit rating, you know, is probably the most contentious area of any credit rating agency is the government work. So that was, was good, but Kind of, I missed the IR portion of my undergrad degree, and so you know, came to my master's degree uh, up at UQ in Queensland. Did that, and then kind of during that degree, kind of really clicked for me that you know, academia and research is what what I wanted to be doing and what I enjoyed, and surprisingly, what I was good at. So, I kind of pursued the academic pathway, you know, research, and did a research thesis in my master's. Uh, worked at UQ for a couple of years, and then you know, COVID, COVID hit. And ended up having to take a take a, a non academic job down here in Canberra uh, for a year or so, and then ended up back in academia, but in public policy over at UNSW, doing uh, working on uh, constitutional reform and the Uluru Statement from the Heart and more social policy based work. But while I was there, I was always, you know, I think it was no secret at UNSW that I was not going to stay. <laughs> I was always looking to escape back to back to my IR homeland, like you know, like those. Like those rhinos in captivity that want to go back to the want to go back to the plains. Like I was longing for the the, you know, the rescue team to come and airlift me out to IR land again, uh, and managed to sort of through a lot of a lot of work and a lot of effort from myself and others here at ANU got myself this position here at the, at the ANU, which yeah, as you said, it started last week. You know, most of that so far has been HR and IT. <laughs> got my you know got my te- my telephone set up and my parking set up and. <laughs> my computer working, but short of that, having done a whole lot in the job in the last sort of six days or so, just because there's not been a lot to do. But I'm excited for the for the start here and the kind of work and PhD aspect of this job. And yeah, it does feel a bit though. Yeah, I've, I've kind of I kind of came to IR the long way around a bit, not as long as some people have. You know, I didn't spend 15 years in banking finance, but did come the long way around to choosing IR academia as a as a as a career. Mm, yeah, the long way around's the best way around, I think, uh, for <laughs> our field. Uh, yeah, that line about the rhinoceros looking to escape back to the plains it reminds me of working in the Australian public service back before I did my <laughs> PhD, and my my PhD scholarship was my liberation <laughs> from the APS. I got to say, it's the one job I've, I've never worked for the Australian public service, and I thank my lucky stars that I never have. I, I have friends who work there, and they do feel like animals in captivity. They do feel like like when you go to the zoo and you see the lion in this in, in enclosure the size of your apartment and you're like, that's just sad. You know, it's I'm sure they're enjoying themselves, but it's just it's a little sad watching these really smart people in the public service kind of pottering about when I don't know, for us it feels more freeing. You know, I, I feel more free as an academic to say and do the research that really I feel matters most and I feel is important. And I compare myself sometimes to some of the friends I've had in who joined the you know, graduate programs when I joined academia. And they've had good careers and they've done some good things in, the, in, the, in, the, in those years. But I don't know, I feel like I would have been hampered, hampered having joined the public service. Well, you've definitely hit the ground running in terms of being a public intellectual. So I <laughs> first, first came across your work uh, and some of the stuff that you wrote for the Lowy Interpreter and the conversation over the last couple of years. Uh, and also following you on Twitter, and you've been very active in calling for greater First Nations representation and platforming in in the international relations discipline and and in the practice of of IR and diplomacy. Uh, The first thing I came across where you were were doing this stuff was in a a curated reading list that you did with Elizabeth Strakosh. Yeah, which was an extraordinary reading list of different Indigenous scholarship in political science, public policy and IR, not just from Australia, but from around the world. And then more recently on, on Twitter, you've been making similar calls for greater First Nations representation in IR. Do you want to speak to that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, first of all, apologies to you and everyone else who follows my Twitter. 
<laughs> deepest apologies for any and all of the content that's there. I don't regret any of it, but just apologies that you have to look at it. <laughs> it's very entertaining. I'm, on, I'm afraid. I'm on Twitter a little too much, I think. We, I worked out once that I've tweeted on average across time I've had Twitter about once every 35 minutes during waking hours, not if, if not, not counting sleep, you know, deducting sleep from that. I'm on Twitter a lot, so apologies. Yeah, I think, and also on, on the work with Liz, uh, that was, you know, that's kind of started off as a project that UQ's uh, School of Political Science had. They, they kind of wanted to develop this list or this kind of, kind of a guide to, for, their own, for, for their own staff as to how they could kind of integrate more Indigenous resources into their coursework, into their teaching, into their own research. But I think what the biggest problem a lot of people had was that just they weren't sure where to start. Like, you know, where do you, who do you look for? If you don't know who those names are in, the, in, the, in, the, in that space, you're not sure really who you should be reading, who you shouldn't be reading, you know, what's good, what's bad, how to, how to integrate those things. So it's sort of there, you know, because the head of school there and the, and, the, and, the, and the kind of executive at the school went, look, we kind of want to develop this kind of content for our own staff and kind of this how-to guide for our own staff. And so Liz, uh, uh, Alyssa McCoon, who's now at QUT, Morgan Brigger, myself, kind of worked on this on this document to kind of put it together. And uh, it kind of really hit the ground running, you know, a lot of staff are there, use it to redevelop courses. A lot of staff there, you know, found it quite helpful, especially the kind of the kind of how-to stuff at the start. And then, you know, I had a couple of colleagues Outside of UQ, who wanted to have a get, I wanted to have a hat, sort of have a look at it, and you know, forward it on to them, and they absolutely fell in love with it. You know, really found it helpful, and then it kind of morphed from there into this kind of into the public facing document that we have now. So you know, Liz and I thought rather than kind of hoard it, hoard it for ourselves, we'll put it on a, as a Google Doc. It's publicly available; anyone can look at it, access it. You know, sort of share the love around the IR public, public policy political science community, and it does get updated. Semi regularly, I think it was the last updated in 2020, 2021. Uh, it's probably due for another update in terms of obviously, you know, content, you know, new people's content. Most of the authors there are, are, are alive in publishing. So, you know, kind of have to keep track of who's doing that. And much good work has been out since that's been done. Um, but yes, that kind of started off there. And that kind of started off, kind of kicked off my foray into this kind of course curriculum development work that I've done a lot of since at UNSW, at University of Canberra. Here, here to be done at the ANU around, you know, First Nations people in IR. And, you know, you referred to some of the Twitter call outs that I've had recently. You know, I make the joke that like IR academia, who are First Nations in this country, could fit into a Honda Civic. Like there's about five of us, six of us who are IR academics who are First Nations. And obviously that's excluding a fair number of IR practitioners in the, the government, the not for profit, the community space who are doing great work and should get shouted out and celebrated way more than they currently do. But in terms of the academic space and researchers and you know, those who are teaching into our university courses, we could all fit into my Subaru. Like, there's not a lot of us. And I think that leads to a problem with the, with the way that we teach IR in this country is that obviously IR is a very uh, Eurocentric, kind of Westphalian-dominated discipline to, to begin with. But then the way we teach it in this country, the way we teach political science in this country is to kind of avoid questions of, indigen of indigeneity, indigenous sovereignty, indigenous ways of knowing and being, you know, the fact that we have 80,000 years of continuing ontologies and epistemologies and things in this country often get sort of ignored and, or, or just not taught. And it both presents a, it presents a problem to me for a number of reasons. You know, there's a thousand reasons why it's a bad thing. But the kind of the, the, the big one to me are, one, it doesn't teach our students things they should be learning. Like if, if, you, if we think of the kind of the kind of political science IR graduate we want to have, we want them to be fully aware of the world and fully aware of what's going on in all aspects of political theory and political understanding. And if we're neglecting to teach them Indigenous-focused content or Indigenous ways of knowing and Indigenous stories, then they're not learning to the fullest extent that they could be. So they're actually getting a lesser education than we could be providing them. And the second thing is obviously, you know, it's about representation, you know. We want to be teaching and having our research reflect the world that we live in. It, it is international relations. It should be reflective of the international environment. And if we're excluding a fair portion of the world's population and a fair portion of population that, that has interests over a fair portion of, you know, global land mass and, and wildlife and conservation and, you know, climate change specifically, you know, we're excluding narratives and people's that have a really important 
have really important things to say to the to the things that we're doing. And so I think you know, and and the third thing, I think it's also about kind of for First Nation students, you know, for for us, for the for younger me, for me ten years ago, me five years ago, it's about you know if if you're coming into that classroom and you're being taught that. International systems only about European states and realism and liberalism and okay, we'll do one week on women and we'll do one week on on communism, but you know that's the week they get. Women feminism gets gets one week and that's it. And in, indigenous issues, or you get you, you may you might get a week if you get a, a progressive enough professor to teach it. Otherwise, nothing. I, you know, it doesn't encourage us, I think, to want to enter the classroom. Well, it encourages some of us, you know, it encouraged me because I'm, you know, I saw that and went, well, I need to be contributing. I, I, I want to be, you know, I, I want to enter this space to add, to bring my community's voice into this space. But a lot of us, a lot of people I know, a lot of students I've taught who have been First Nations have said, look, they just don't feel the discipline's for them. You know, they don't feel it's a space in which they're valued, in which they're understood, in which their culture and community is, is respected in the way it should be. And it, it discourages them from, you know, going beyond the undergraduate. You know, they'll do their undergrad IR degree and go, that really wasn't for me. It wasn't about me. It didn't speak to me in any way. And then you see them not going on to PhDs, not going on to master's degrees, not, and then and therefore not entering, either, either not entering academia. You know, there are a couple of us doing PhDs at the moment. I think there's about four or five of us doing PhDs across the country who are Indigenous in, in IR. But, you know, if you're not entering a master's degree, you know, they're probably not going to be pursuing foreign policy as a career, either within the government or with the not-for-profit sector or with their own communities, they're not going to see it as a, as a viable place to work, a viable space for them to pursue a career, because we are not teaching them the discipline in a way that, is, that actually is accurate. We, you know, we're inaccurately teaching our, our discipline to students, and therefore and that has untold effects beyond, you know, I've mentioned regular students, but also in, you know, First Nation students as well. It's a, it's a really good point about how much of a narrow sliver of the human experience that traditional IR covers. Mm. So like, I know my students, a lot of them are coming into IR and, and they're shocked to learn that the modern international system as they understand it is very young and it's a European export that found its way elsewhere around the world through colonialism and that there's thousands of years of societies interacting with each other uh, and established practices that go way back. Yeah, exactly. I think it's it's this weird misconception that kind of the international system is this has been this permanently existing conception. I mean, even within Europe, it's not it's not that old. Like, you know, our understanding of nation states only goes back to the 1650s. Like before that, it was a very different system of understanding around how the international, you know international relations was conducted. So yeah, yeah, even within Europe, which is where this has come from, it's not that in the in the broad scheme of things, not that enduring. You know, states aren't, haven't been a, a, a real concept for that long. Politically, historically speaking, obviously, you know, 400 years is a long time, but not long in terms of the 80,000 years First Nations in this country have been here, you know, we, with our own kind of, you know, interrelational systems. And so, yeah, I think it's, it, it, always, it always surprises me how much the students are surprised when you kind of air those facts of like, oh, yeah, this is actually quite recent. This is a new thing. This is, and, and this is a colonial thing, right? As you mentioned, you know, this is a thing that Britain and other states, you know, Britain, France, et cetera, exported out, out into the world. I think a lot of students get quite surprised by that. And some of them will get quite confronted by it. Some of them are a bit like, oh, you know, shit. Like, you know, they get quite, especially, a, you know, some of the more whiter privileged students get a bit confronted by this notion that we've been around longer and, you know, we've, you know there, there are different ways of doing things. And so, yeah, that always surprises me, the level at which students sometimes get confronted or get shocked. It happens less now, I think, than it did even five years ago. I think we are doing better in our teaching and I think our society is doing better in our educating. We're nowhere near where we should be, but we are doing better. I've had students more recently are less confronted and less less shocked, but still, even you still get a fair few that are like, what's that word? Shooketh. They're just shooketh. <laughs> that, that, that you could be telling them these things. <laughs> that, yeah. you know, Indigenous people in, in Australia, you know, were, were, were conducting complex diplomatic relations for tens of thousands of years, both internally within the continent and externally with, you know, other, other polities in Southeast Asia and the Pacific. It, it blows their minds sometimes that that's the case. And it's like, yeah, like, we've always known that as First Nations. You know, we've been telling you that for 240-something years. 
no one's bothered to listen until the last kind of couple. So yeah, it's it's it surprises me how 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 the students react to that sometimes. Yeah, last year you had a couple of articles, one in the Lowy Interpreter and one in the Conversation, where you wrote about this idea of First Nations diplomacies. To flesh that out, how would you describe First Nations diplomacies as a practice and as a field of inquiry? Oh, that is that is, I think, the question of the decade. I think at this point for me, I'm not sure. I think if if anyone has the answer, who's listening, um, uh, be quiet. Like, don't tell anybody. I still haven't worked. I don't know. So I don't know. I shouldn't say that. If anyone out there has the answer, uh, please do come and tell me. Um, come and to, come and come and let me know. No, I think you know. I think yeah. First Nations diplomacy, First Nations foreign policies, a little bit different. I think you know, First Nations diplomacy is we're kind of referring to these kind of, I say traditional, but kind of indigenous practices unique to us. You know how it, how is it that we as First Nations groups interact with other groups? You know what what are our, what are, what are our inherent interpolity relations? Like that's what, when we're referring to. Diplomacy is that's more of what the literature speaks to in terms of, you know, what Indigenous groups, how we interact amongst ourselves and with, with outsiders, you know, what are our diplomatic practices, what are our foreign policy approaches. When we're talking about Indigenous foreign policy, that's a slightly different, it's similar, but it's different. It's essentially trying to take the first bit and try and see how we can integrate that within a more, let's say, Western, more mainstream foreign policy. If we take, if we take those articles I've, I've, I've written about, you know, we take, take New Zealand as the, as the first example, you know, um, New Zealand's Foreign Minister uh, Nanaia Mahuta uh, launched to some fanfare at the beginning of last year, kind of First Nations foreign policy, where she was looking to integrate Maori values and you know, integrate Te Reo Maori, the Maori language, into her foreign policy practice and foreign policy agenda to kind of integrate those First Nations diplomacies within a more Western framework. In the same way you could talk about a feminist foreign policy or a realist foreign policy, or a you know, liberal foreign policy. You know, she was trying to say, look, we, you can also have a have a Maori foreign policy, have a, have an indigenous foreign policy where we prioritize indigenous voices, prioritize indigenous practices, uh, indigenous values. You know, whatever they may be to the location that you're in. You know, obviously, Maori values are different and similar in various ways to you know my own Radjuri culture, and would be different to other First Nations cultures around the country. Um, but again, she's trying to she was trying to highlight that you know in her country, in in Aotearoa, New Zealand, that's what she was looking to do in terms of you know in that way of integrating First Nations diplomacies within a foreign policy practice. And so we kind of you know there's different there's been different ways to refer to that. I think the term that's kind of kind of kicked off amongst those of us who work in the space is Indigenous foreign policy. Uh, it's it's still such, it's still such, such a new field though. We haven't quite worked out what the term is yet. We're still kind of arguing around amongst ourselves what what it is we're going to refer to this discipline as. Uh, I'm I'm part of to indigenous foreign policy, but I think, you know, I'm happy to accept the will of the group. You know, what's that what, what's that quote from Star Wars? If if that be the will of the council, I'm happy to accept accept, accept the will of the council. Uh, if the if the term is decided to be different. Uh, you know, I've not been granted the rank of master yet. <laughs> it's like Anakin Skywalker. So I'm happy to accept the judgments of those more senior than me. Um, but yeah, so it's kind of in a, you know Australia launched similarly uh, an Indigenous diplomacy agenda uh, in May of 2020. Um, my article about that in 2020 in May, sorry, in May of 2021. Sorry, my article about that in the May, I think, is more glowing than subsequent articles. I've written about it. I wrote about it in December of last, uh, no, no, in November of last year. And I've got something coming out, some hopefully sometime soon this year on it. Long story short, it's kind of shit. <laughs> the agenda in Australia is kind of kind of shitty, um, put it that way. I hope no one who's worked on it is listening because I need favours from them all the time, <laughs> but it is kind of shitty. Uh, not through any fault of the people who necessarily worked on it. They're all good people. I know of a, a number of them who worked on it. I think the problem with it is it kind of it had a lot of potential. That was the thing that, you know, I wrote about in May last year, you know, the potential of what Australia was doing compared to New Zealand. You know, New Zealand's approach was big on the rhetoric very small in the detail, not a lot of practical, tangible, how are you actually going to do this? And even since then, there's been very little. And I'm, you know, constantly digging through Minister Mahuda's speeches and things about to find, try and find some nuggets of actual planning from them in New Zealand. As Australia kind of took the opposite approach, we kind of went, you know, we'll do a lot of detail here. We'll kind of dig into actual tangible goals, very little rhetoric, very little overall vision. But again, you know, the difference there is obviously in New Zealand, it was the minister who launched this policy. In Australia, it was 
uh, then Secretary Adamson. So it was much more departmental focused. Maurice Payne, I'm not sure, has an interest one way or the other. <clears throat> um, I know Penny Wong does uh, over in the opposition. So we might see a bit more of a vision there if, if Labour win the election in a, in a couple of months. Um, but what DFAT did, I think, was, you know, they had it on detail, but they kind of stuffed up in two key ways, which was they both didn't consult anybody in community. So absolutely lack of lack of consultation with really any of the key stakeholders outside of the business community, outside of the indigenous business community, which is, you know, they are stakeholders. Not sure they're the kind of stakeholders you'd want be wanting for, for all of this work. The trade work, sure, but not necessarily, not, not necessarily the <laughs> diplomatic stuff and the kind of foreign policy the mushroom cloud thinking. And the second thing was that they haven't done anything on it since May. Well, sorry, I tell a lie. They have done stuff on it, but it's all been behind closed doors. It's actually, it's actually very funny. I wrote this piece in November in the Canberra Times sort of calling out the six months of the agenda, no real public update on it. You know, the incoming secretary, um, whose name currently escapes me. I don't know why. Oh, Catherine Campbell of uh, RoboDebt fame, everyone's favourite governmental secretary. A friend made a joke, uh, actually, when she got appointed, was that we should be getting a robo-diplomats, <laughs> which I thought was very apt. Get robo uh, you know, your, your robo-consular assistance, <laughs> Secretary Campbell. But um, she's not really so much interest in it, if at all. She's not really a very, she's not, she's not really a very public secretary compared to the way I think Francis Adamson was very public and very visible. But I think the thing was, you know, so they kind of hadn't really done a lot on it. There'd been no real public announcements, no public updates, no information sessions, nothing really beyond the launch. And I wrote this piece of calling them out on it because I go, you know, where's the updates? Where's the info? Where's like, what's that, you know, where's the beef, right? Uh, and then I get, I, I, was, I ran into someone uh, on the streets of Canberra a couple of weeks later um, who was working on it. They kind of had a go at me for, for the pit. No, 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 had a go. They kind of, uh, didn't like the content of my piece in the Canberra Times and said, look, and they said, yeah, look, you just don't know how much work we're doing behind the scenes, which to me was like, that was the whole, that was the whole critique. Like the whole critique was you're doing all this work secretly. And the response from someone at DFAT was, yeah, but look at all this secret work we're doing. Like, I think there's a bit of a, and I had to sort of stop for a second and just let my brain process that and go, wait, sorry, what? <laughs> Did you just say what I think you just said? Yeah, we get you didn't like how much secret work we're doing, but look how much secret work we're doing, <laughs> which just boggled me a little bit. And I, I think that's my biggest flaw on the on the agenda is, but I mean, both the lack of consultation, but lack of consultation is is um, symptomatic of the lack of publicity. Like they're not, there's no consultation because they're not going to the public with it. They're not not going to community with it. And so you know, when I say it's shit, it's because they've got this agenda developed for us in air quotes, but they've not asked us what we want. <laughs> like, it's hard to have a government policy develop an agenda and go, we're doing this for you, but we're not going to really ask you what you want What you want from it. We're not really going to ask your communities or your elders or your knowledge holders or, or many of your stakeholders what we should be doing. We're just kind of going to tell you, which is, to be fair, is the way government likes to do policy with First Nations in this country. They like to set the agenda and go, that's the agenda you get, and and then complain when we don't come to the table. You know, you see it all with constitutional recognition and, you know, pre uluru of like the government would go, oh, you're going to get ATSIC. We're going to develop ATSIC for you. Or the Congress, that's what you're going to get. And we get given this thing and we're not really that supportive of it because it's kind of shitty and designed wrong and it had, you know, inherent flaws built into the things. And then we don't get involved as much and we, you know, low turnout for things. And then the government takes it away and goes... We took it away because you didn't care enough. It's like, well, we didn't care because you didn't involve us in the design. Uh, the IDA, Indigenous Diplomacy Agenda, feels the same as that. Like, they've got this agenda for us that no one really has a stake in, no one really has, an in, has reason to go to bat for it for, unless you work for the department. So then when we don't get as enthusiastic about it in five years' time, they're going to go, oh, you didn't care when we gave you the agenda. It's like, well, you didn't ask us what we wanted in the agenda. You just kind of told us what it is what it is we should be expecting, you know, from a department, which, you know, I, I, I know we're going to talk about the voice later, but it's kind of one of the reasons I think, you know, we, a voice would be beneficial is that it kind of gives us the ability to actually come to the table and go, no, no, we actually do have views on this thing. You kind of can't just give us give us your, your agenda anymore and go, oh, no, that's it, that's all we're going to give you. You know, if you like it or not, bad luck. 
Yeah, it very much reflects how big bureaucracy does consultation in in quotation marks, isn't it? It's uh, here's the thing. Tell us what you think. Not let's develop the thing together. Yeah, there's there's no. You know, I hate the phrase co-design. It's, it's a really terrible phrase. I'm not a huge fan of the term, but there really is no attempt at that here. There's no attempt at going, let's sit down and do this together. It's we're going to do a thing and we're going to ask you for your opinion. Even if you don't like it, we're still going to give it to you. <laughs> like, you're st- like you're still going to get it. It's like going to a restaurant and going, oh, here's your, here's your pad thai. Oh, sorry if you have an allergy. Like, just like, what if I'm allergic to, you know, to, you know, <laughs> what if I'm allergic to this? Like, see, they're going, here's your satay chicken. Oh, by the way, do you have a peanut allergy? By the way, it's already in front of you, already, already in yeah, anaphylactic shock. Not, yeah. not going, what do you want to order? Like, no, no, we're going to make a thing for you, put it down in front of you, and if you die from it, well, oh, shit. <laughs> you know, James didn't, James wasn't enthusiastic enough about the satay chicken. Meanwhile, I'm there choking on a peanut. I guess yeah. that's the way it deals with policy a bit sometimes with the government. A lot of times, actually, with the government is that, yeah, they kind of, they, they kind of serve the dish down and go, hope there's no allergies. And if there is, we're going to blame you for the anaphylactic shock. Yeah, eat it and like it, or you're ungrateful. Exactly, you're ungrateful, yeah. Mm. But I guess for Indigenous foreign policy to work as an integrative project, like it has to step back, doesn't it? It has to, to use that awful word, it has to be co-creative because you know, you're it, integrating two radically different practices. Yeah, you know, you're totally correct. I mean, it has to step back. It has to kind of take the bigger picture look and go, what is it communities want? And, you know, you're right about the kind of the different systems, but there's a really good piece by... Um, Morgan Brigg, Annie Mary Graham, and Martin Weber at UQ came out last year, I think in August, on kind of the relationality of Indigenous political approaches to Western ones. And yeah, you know, they kind of talk about this, right? Like, you know, Western approaches see Indigenous approaches as totally alien, totally foreign, unintegratable. Whereas the, the, the nature of Indigenous, or as the phrase I use, Aboriginal Australian philosophy, is that because it is relational, it always seeks understanding with with the alternative it's it's never going to it's never going to try and present itself as as oppositional it's always going to try and seek the relationality the understanding the commonalities so it's, it's kind of this weird tension of of difference only coming from one end like it's only one end that sees this difference as insurmountable it's only those at the western end that see the difference as unachievable and kind of we, we really can't bridge this divide where is it at, you know, I say at, at our end, at the indigenous, at the First Nations end, we're like, no, no, you know, we have, we have relational ways of being, relational ways of understanding. We're always seeking to kind of, you know, understand ourselves in relation to others, in relation to other systems, and kind of find those commonalities. And so it's weird to me. It, it is weird to me. I think that the divide and the, the resistance is only at the one end, right? It's only from this from this one end, but it's the end that needs to come to the table. You know, they, yeah. I think because of that, they're not ever going to come to the table willingly. They're not ever going to come to this dialogue on their own. They're kind of going to have to be dragged to it. I mean, in the way that you kind of, you know, on the issue of First Nations voice, government has to be dragged to it. They're not coming to this willingly. Yeah, I think any area of Indigenous policy, they're not coming to the table willingly looking to, to engage. They're going to be dragged, kicking and screaming a bit. And again, there are sovereignty issues. There are sovereignty reasons behind why that is. And there are white people reasons why that is. And there is Western ontology reasons why that is. But yeah, they're never going to come willingly. They kind of have to be dragged a bit, and that's the job of that's the kind of job I see myself doing. I see, I think, a lot of our communities see ourselves doing is dragging them a bit. You know, forcing them to actually engage with us on equal terms, on our terms. You know, engage with us as a sovereign, autonomous nation and sovereign, autonomous peoples with equal standing in on the issues we're wanting to engage on. Government obviously sees themselves as, as they see a hierarchical way of being, a hierarchical way of engaging, and so it's about sort of dragging them to, uh, to dragging them to, to the table in a more a more lateral way of of engaging with us. That relationality aspect is really important. Is that it speaks to just such a different ontology about relationship, and not just with other people and other societies, but you know with ecosystems. You know, I you know when I first discovered how kinship systems work hmm. uh, in some Indigenous cultures and just the, the level of sophistication about 
an attention to detail about relationships between people and with and with non-human life and with landscapes and stuff that absolutely blew my mind. It's at a level of sophistication way beyond uh, anything that the Westphalian system's got going for it. But it's clearly not well understood in sort of the governance structures. No, and I think also the thing I find most interesting about it from an ac- academic point of view, obviously I have my own cultural uh, values built into it, but, you know, as an academic, I find interesting is the kind of comparison between the two systems in terms of where the focus is. You know, the focus in this witness, where failing understanding is on the state, on the government, on the power of the state. The focus, for, at least for my own laboratory in cosmology and ontologies, and I, again, I can't speak to other nations beyond my own and just wanted to be, wanted to be clear on that because every nation is slightly different. But generally, these are also what's in but I'll speak specifically here to Radri people. You know, the focus is on, on the individual. You know, it's our individual responsibility for our relationships, with, with, whether that be with other people, with other entities, with the land, with animals. You know, it's, it's all it, the, central, the central foci focuses focus <laughs> the central focus is on the individual and how we move through our sort of concentric circles of relationships you know it's it's my personal responsibility to care for the patches of country that I'm responsible for it's my personal responsibility to care for my elders it's my personal responsibility to care for my family you know all those things are individual focused relations rather than you know so yes you can have intergroup relations, but again, the focus of, of maintaining those falls on the individuals, not on the group. There is no collective, there is a collective group responsibility, but it's made up of individual actions. It's, you know, we talk about in, in Rotary Culture, we, you know, we talk about moving through, moving through the individual identity, through the thought, through the action, through the relationships and beyond into, 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 into you know, this sort of, six, seven circles there of, of, of understanding, but you kind of you start at the centre and move through the others in terms of relation. And so I think that's the interesting thing to me is that, you know, yeah, in terms of our the kind of ecological stuff and the climate change stuff, you know, the focus is on, you know, what, what, is, what is our individual responsibility as part of a collective? Like, yes, we are a collective. Yes, we have a collective responsibility and there is a collective shared care for country, but it's that shared care and shared responsibility is made up through individual action, which is, um, you know, is an interesting way to take the climate change debate. You know, I think a lot of the focus recently has moved towards, you know, rightly so, the big companies that are that are responsible for a lot of the pollution and 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 and, and damage to our environment. But you know, also a fair part of that also is the individual is the responsibilities of those individuals in those companies as well. You know, people that work there have responsibilities. People, people that run them have. Res- you know, responsibilities. People in, in our government should have individual responsibility, according to at least my own cultural way of viewing that. You know, it's not kind of. I think when we we kind of abstract it a bit, we kind of abstract to the kind of collective. We lose focus on what actually needs doing. You know, we lose we lose focus on who needs whose job it is to do that because it, it, it is someone's job to do that. <laughs> you know, not to make a joke about Scott Morrison as much as I'd love to do that, but he's very much of the that's not my job school of thought. You know, he's very much the that's not for me, you know, way of way of doing things. And I think that kind of goes very counter to my own kind of cultural practice and my own kind of cultural understanding of everyone, it's everyone's individual responsibility, everyone's responsibility as a person within within this great landscape to care for and have and, and respect it and do the right thing. So it's, it is very galling sometimes to see the Prime Minister have this view of, well, that's not my job. <laughs> it's just not what I do. It's like, no, no, you know. You are an individual member of this of, the, of, the, of this collective society. You have equal responsibility for it as everyone else does. You know there is no passing the buck here. He has equal, as equal responsibility as I do. He has more power to affect change, but he has equal responsibility as everyone else does. You've touched on this already in what you've just said. When Indigenous people talk about being connected to country. You know, as a pasty-faced white boy, I think I can intellectually get my head around that. But obviously it means something much deeper to First Nations people. From your personal perspective as a proud Wiradjuri man, how would you try and describe connection to country and what that means? I think it's a very simple way to, that I, I heard recently to put it. I think it's either, it's either came from 
Professor Sue Green at CSU or Aunt Elaine Lomas, and I'll reference both of them just in case it's one or the other. But one of them said, you know, we're not from Wiradjuri country. We are of Wiradjuri country. I think that to me really encapsulates how I understand it. You know, I'm not from that place. I am of that place. It is an inherent part of who I am. It makes up who I am. And I am, because I am of it, not from it, because I am of it, not from it, I'm an integral part of that country's system. I'm an integral part of that country's being as as well. It's part of me and I am part of it. So, So there's a shared responsibility, care, love, connection, culture between me and that country. We aren't just, I think, yeah, that's a bit better to put it, I think. You know, we aren't we aren't from that place in, in the way that you can be, you know, I'm from Sydney. I'm from Sydney. I grew up in Sydney. I'm arguably, if I'm from anywhere, I'm from there. I am of Radjuri country. That is a central part of who I am, of my of, of my of myself, of my being, of my culture, of my law, both L-A-W and L-O-R-E, <laughs> both for, both forms of that word. Uh, yeah, so I think that that's the that's the way I think at least for me personally I understand it to be. Others have different ways of understanding it. I've heard I've heard many good ways of explaining that from many different First Nations people. And there's no one right way to explain connection to country, connection to culture in that way. But I think for me that's the way I think I best I best feel it, especially when I go back there. You know, when I'm on Radri country, it's a different feeling than, than being anywhere else. It really is, and it's that's that's something that's not something I can describe because it's not a thing that's that's describable. You know, I've tried before to describe it both verbally and in writing, and it ends up being being this kind of word vomit. So I'm not going to try and do that to you here or do that to your listeners. But yeah, I think yeah, it's 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 of being of a place, it, it being part of you, and you being part of it. That so you are you're part of that country. You are as of that country as the rocks, as the trees, as the animals that are there as those rivers, as those creeks. And also it's they're all as they're, they're all a part of you as my lungs and my limbs and you know and my terribly functioning liver. You know, all those things are equally as part of me as all my organs are. And I'm I'm as part of that country as all of those form all, all of those organs of country, right? You know, the the rocks and the and the earth and the soil and everything else. This is a good point now to transition to speaking about the Uluru Statement from the Heart and your work in the Uluru Dialogue. So where's that process at the moment? What are some of the key issues? Can can you speak to the work that you've been doing there? Yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, I'm obviously very privileged to be a part of the Uluru Dialogue out of UNSW and, you know, working to campaign the Uluru Statement. Where we are currently, um, obviously, you know, we're coming up on five years from the Uluru Statement from the Heart and the well, the Constitutional Convention uh, that they, they gave us that you know great poetic piece of political history. Um, currently, the government's um, voice to parliament plans are ostensibly stalled before the election. There's not enough t- sitting time in the calendar for them to legislate. They have released a model for a voice. You know, so the government has responded to the order statement by uh, launching into its process of des- of designing a voice model. Uh, they're not looking. The coalition is not looking to have a referendum on the issue, uh, which is, of course, the key essential element of a voice, according to those at the Uluru Convention, is that it must be enshrined in the constitution that is an essential component of a voice. Um, So the government has a model out. Um, It's flawed in in a number of different ways. You know, it's good in a number of different ways. I think it's a it's it's a good first step to see what a model would look like. I think it still needs a lot of work, but there is a model out there. There's a model for a voice. It exists. And currently, so the currently there's pending legislation um, before the parliament, or at least there will be pending legislation before the parliament. It won't get passed this term. Uh, and so essentially what we're doing, we're kind of the current work of the campaign and those of us at the Uluru Dialogue is to kind of pressure government, pressure parliament, pressure the Australian people into pushing this as a referendum issue. You know, we need to have the vote on a referendum. Like that's the, I think that's the, that, you know, well, what a talk around the voice from the government in the last couple of years has been, you know, oh, a voice is good, and like just any voice will do. You know, le- legislated, incorporated, enshrined didn't really matter. And I think what we're what we're trying, trying, trying to say with the campaign is, no, it does matter. Like the format of a voice, the structure of a voice is extremely important to its function, to its success, to its viability, to its support amongst community. Like it is the key part of the reform. Like 
is the enshrinement in the constitution. That is the whole, that was the whole point of the um, referendum council and the Uluru convention and the regional dialogues around the country in 2016, 17. The whole, that was the whole point of the Uluru statement. That was the whole point of the process preceding the referendum council. It's been the whole point of the process since then is to have a referendum, have a public national vote to enshrine a voice. And so I think the current purpose of the campaign is around doing that and kind of highlighting the issues of why it is a referendum is so important, why it is enshrinement is, is, is crucial. I think the other lesser thing is we've seen a lot of movement at a state level recently and at some of the minor parties around upending the sequence. So the sequence of those of the order of statement and the kind of it's, it's call for change, for those who don't know, is voice, treaty, truth. And, you know, there's been some um, state governments who've sort of started their own treaty process before we have a voice. Uh, the Greens in particular um, have flipped the ordering to go um, truth, treaty, voice. Uh, and I think that, so it's part of the work of the campaign is also kind of educating people as to why it is voice, treaty, truth is in the order that it's in and why it is that it actually is equally as essential as an enshrined voice is doing them in the right order. Like that order is not accidental. We didn't just kind of put them in a little barrel and rotate, you know, do a little bingo lottery as to what order they should be in. That was designed by the First Nations of the Regional Dialogues and the Order of Convention and in conjunction with, you know, a whole host of academic experts, First Nations and not across the country as to what this should look like and what how to best articulate the vision of the communities that were, that were consulted in this process. And so, yeah, part of our work is also trying to educate people is to go, you know, it, it, it is voice, truly truth. Like that is the order. That is, what, that is the order that community wants. That's the order that needs to happen in to be most effective. So, yeah, the kind of prongs of the campaign are, are, are twofold, both encouraging for a vote on a voice. So that's the direction government and the Labor Party seem to be pushing is to have a voice very quickly. They just committed to the order at least. Um, but also kind of convincing those uh, other people at other levels of government, other levels of politics, that that ordering is important. We do need to do it in the right sequence to get have the most effective political outcome at the end. Just briefly, what's the logic behind that particular sequencing? So, yeah, I'll both explain the sequencing and I'll explain actually why it is an enshrined voice is important because I think both of those are, are key. We'll start with, with the sequencing. So the reason we have Voice Treaty Truth is essentially to build momentum to build the momentum on the ground for change. First of all, a, a voice gives the most tangible change, most tangible benefit most immediately. So if you're starting with a voice, you're enacting a body, enshrining a body, sorry, that has the power to immediately start getting to work on bringing our voice to the table, getting us, getting our perspectives involved in government and legislation uh, and sort of immediately, you know, once it's established, immediately can, can, can get to work. That work will take its time, of course, and become most effective, but it, it can start on day one of its, of its you know, establishment, really getting, getting to the work of actual, actual change. And that is the thing, actually, that we, that we found most often through the regional, or the, the, those at the regional dialogues found most often was that community wanted actual tangible benefit. One of the comments that came up, up from a session at the end at Uluru was, you know, we've had a lot of, we've had a lot of talking. We've had a lot of truth telling. We've had a lot of airing of our problems, with no tangible result. So starting with truth, truth telling. In, in, take the example of the Greens proposal. Starting with truth telling, you know, a lot of what we've had before. You know, much much more of the same again. We've had a lot of truth telling commissions and royal commissions and truth telling processes that don't lead anywhere. It's just kind of lead to a report that no one reads, and doesn't actually bring our communities any change. It just airs more grievances and airs more trauma for us that we have to then deal with that actually really bring any benefit to us. And so that's the reason truth is last. Uh, that's the reason voice is first. There isn't treaties in the middle. That's, that's the one that gets a lot of contention. You know, treaty is a big popular issue. A lot of people, especially Victoria, are very pro-treaty. The reason treaty is second is because and there are a number of reasons. The one that kind of I'm, I, one that I bring up a lot because uh, I, th I think holds most water for me, and there are all, all of them are hold water. But the one that sort of sticks to me the most, I think, is that you know when you're looking at a treaty at a national level, who is it that negotiates that? Who is it that decides the format that takes place in? Who is it that decides who that treaty covers? Who is it that that, that represents us in that in that level? Uh, and you know, a voice essentially both is empowered to be that body if it wanted to, but also is empowered to make a body. 
to the call for the receiver is for the voice to set up a Makarata commission to engage with treaty making. It would the voice being an elected Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander body would have the collective community and most importantly cultural authority to set up a body from which to negotiate treaties with state and Commonwealth governments. It brings the institutional heft of a constitutionally enshrined body and also brings the cultural heft of being an elected culturally authentic body from which to negotiate treaty and then from which to, ne- from which to have truth-telling. Because, you know, the, the argument is the argument is the argument that I'm, I'm trying to put forward here is that, you know, you get voice, you get change, you get institutional heft, you get treaty, you get reform of understanding, and then you get truth, you get finding it, you get reform of society. And that, that's the kind of sequencing. And that's what kind of why the sequencing is important. And that actually leads into why it is an enshrinement is important. Because the, an, an unenshrined body, a body that's not in the constitution, doesn't have that institutional authority doesn't have the heft of the constitution behind it because it can be repealed at any moment. You know, we've lived through ATSIC in the 90s, you know, National Congress repealed, defunded respectively. And that's the thing also that we heard a lot of community say during the dialogues was that, you know, they don't want another ATSIC or they don't want another Congress, another thing the government can establish. And then when the voice does something the government doesn't like, government yanks it, you know, repeals it, gets rid of it. We don't have it anymore. We've got to start again. Whereas, you know, you put something in the, in the Constitution, you know, both the process to in, put something in the Constitution requires a national vote. It requires a majority of people in a majority of states, for those who aren't familiar with our you know, referendum processes. So that, that, that's a heavy bar. But also that means to remove it, there's, equally a, there's an equally heavy bar. It's an equally burdensome effort to get rid of it. The second thing is uh, having, a, having it done that way via referendum gives it a national mandate that legislating does not. It, it's something that the Australian people, if it's successful, would have voted for in a double majority. You know, a double majority of Australians would have voted for a First Nations voice. So any government looking to remove it is going to think twice or three times about actually going about that agenda. For one thing, it's quite difficult to get that done if it's in the Constitution. Secondly, it's quite politically difficult to remove to try and remove a thing that the Australian people, in some senses, overwhelmingly voted for. You know, you threw a you know, majority of people in a majority of states overwhelmingly supported. So that, that's kind of why it is that the sequencing is important. And that's kind of, you know, the five second version as to why it is enshrinement important. And but both those need to be done together. You, know, you need to have it in the right sequence and in the right format, you know, for the reforms to really deliver the kind of change that community wanted to see um, at Uluru. In terms of the diplomatic process, I guess you need the voice to be able to provide the sovereign body, if you like, that can negotiate on equal terms within mm, that yeah. within that sovereign system for what the, the many many dozens of different indigenous nations yeah exactly the voice and the Makarata commission it would eventually create would be on an equal footing with the commonwealth government because it would have the same kind of institutional constitutional authority that the government comes with right the government is only the government's only empowered through the constitution right the government only exists because of our constitution and our constitutional democracy, if you have a, a body equal, with equally firm footing, it has equal authority and equal sovereign sovereign right, especially as, as an elected body for us, equal sovereign right to negotiate on our behalf and represent our, our views. And yet it's not going to be to, to heads up the questions I'm sure you'll get in, in an email, I'm sure I'll get in an email. It's not a third chamber of parliament. It can't veto laws. It's not meant to be deciding legislation. It's meant to be a representative body for us to represent our issues, represent our to represent our unceded sovereignty, to represent our unceded rights to this land and unceded rights to it to, to to country and community and culture. And so, you know, that's what it's meant to do. It's meant to represent our views and our and, and our rights and our sovereignty. And putting it in the constitution gives it equal footing with the government because we do share sovereignty with the crown, right? We do share sovereignty with the crown. And so a body that is enshrined in the constitution would share constitutional authority with the government. It would share, so not authority, it wouldn't have any authority to do anything in terms of make laws. It wouldn't have the authority to make a law or pass a bill or reject a bill or sign a bill, but it would have authority from an from a, from a, a institutional standpoint, you know, it, both equally constitutionally enshrined in that same way. So looking at the, the end game of this process, would it be accurate to describe it as 
self-determination or dual sovereignty, joint sovereignty? What? How would you describe that from a sort of political science? I, I, I couldn't speak to the end, the end, what the end point looks like. I think, or, the end, or is it developing something that's a bit new? That, that is the that is the thing. It's developing a new kind of way of governance. It's not necessarily going for a. I'm not sure the voice treaty truth process is looking to go back to a sovereignty model or a land back model or a, I think it's looking to create a new system and way of governing Australia. It's looking to create a newer Australia, you know, a different way for us to inter- a new way for us as First Nations to interact with our government, a new way for government and Australian society to interact with First Nations. I think it's looking to set up something new and something different, something that hasn't been done in this country before. So I don't think it I don't think it can be compared to any of the other things that we've kind of talked about or, any, or nor can it be seen to be leading to the kind of uh, dual sovereignty or, you know, as, as we've seen on Twitter, you know, land back. I don't think it's going to lead to any of those things. I think it's going to lead to something new, something different, but something uniquely Australian, something uniquely, you know, unique to us and unique to the unique to the vast diversity of this country's First Nations. I think that's better in a, in a sense than kind of some of those, those, those other approaches. But I think, yeah, it's going to be something very different to what we've necessarily can, could, could conceptualise today. Are there any other comparable models in other settler colonial societies worldwide? Not that I can think of to, a, to on, on, on top of my head. Obviously, you know, every, every settler colonial country has its own unique relationship with First Nations. You know, New Zealand, uh, sorry, Aotearoa New Zealand has a treaty, uh, but, a, but a first contact treaty and has... And has you know dedicated seats in Parliament and a very different relationship. You know, in Canada they have treaties and a, and a very different relationship. Uh, no guaranteed seats in Parliament, but also no no voice in the way that we would envision this. You know, in in Finland and Sweden and Norway, you know, they have a Sami Parliament. In America, you know, they're considered you know sovereign nations with you know their own governments and things. So I think every sovereign, every settler state has its own unique way of engaging with or as some people would say dealing with it's, it's first nations people uh i think what we're looking to do here with with a voice and with treaty and with truth is, is a uniquely australian way of doing things that has been designed for a uniquely australian uniquely first nations perspective there are there are comparisons to all those others you know there are ways of looking at it looking at it that resemble all those, all those other approaches in other states but i don't think i think it's a voice of parliament in the way we in the way that all the resentment envisions it is very unique to here. And I think that's a good thing. I think we, sh- you know, we shouldn't be copying other states because every other set where colonial state is uniquely different. Every other set of colonial state has its own unique history, unique trauma, unique colonial violence, unique engagement history, unique government systems. You know, so I think having a, having a process and a body that's uniquely developed for this country and for our First Nations, I think, is the best approach. Is there anything else you want to say about the Uluru Statement? Yes, actually, I'm just going to be a little campaign plug. So that, um, anyone who wants to find out more can go to uluristatement.org. Uh, the website's new and revamped, so please go have a look. The current campaign thing obviously, is obviously to write to your member of parliament. There's a little letter writing feature on the website you can go look at. And if you want campaign merch, go to the Iconic. You can buy it all at the Iconic for rather rather a not that expensive an amount. You can buy T-shirts and I think soon to be other things. But, yeah, just to plug the campaign and say anyone who wants to find out more, can head to the campaign website. There's a ton of articles and resources and frequently asked questions and and things on there. And so I would encourage anyone to, if they're you know, unsure, has questions, read up more, you know, learn more, come to events. We have webinars and events all the time. So do you know, from a campaign point of view, you know, just encourage folk to to get more involved with the campaign as best they can and to also to encourage their MPs to support and enshrine voice. Got to give the campaign plug, right? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Edge Dwellers Cafe. Let's cycle back now a bit more back to the university yeah, and our course. discipline and talking about decolonizing the university, decolonizing praxis. What are you seeing in this area that's encouraging? Uh, or not encouraging. With, can, I, can I start with what's not encouraging? Yeah. Although not for the reason you might think. You know, we had a workshop, a bunch of academics recently about on this very topic, actually, how to decolonize our curricula, how to decolonize our IR disciplines. And I think the thing we kind of got from that, at least I got from that, was I'm not sure it's possible. Like, I'm not sure it's possible to fully and completely and thoroughly do this in a way that's authentic. Like, I'm just not sure it's, it's possible. 
<laughs> so that's I think that's what's discouraging. But I think that, that that didn't come from like white people saying saying you can't do this. It came from a bunch of people of color and First Nations academics and other academics who do this work going, oh, just, we're just not sure we can do it. We're just not sure it's it's a mountain that's climbable for a number of reasons. You know, obviously we're Western institutions. In Western in a Western settler state, you know, our discipline is very Eurocentric and Western. To what extent can we fully decolonize? And that's for a number of reasons, I think, because you know, for, for on the one hand, you get the kind of the paradox of if the more successful this gets, the more the university tries to co-opt it. And the more the university tries to kind of claim the decolonizing as its own and 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 weaken it and kind of water it down, you know, like really weak cordial. You know, it, it sees it and kind of and that's the thing that that's the thing I'm seeing a lot of at the moment. You know, there is a lot of success at the moment in terms of decolonizing our universities, you know, in terms of increasing the number of indigenous staffing. You know, there's more, you know, in terms of like I started this year and in this in, the, in this particular position I'm in, uh, 14 or 15 others started with me at the same time, indigenous PhD students in the same program um, across the university. So that's that's encouraging. Um, you know, you're seeing the kind of courses that we're teaching. Have more indigenous focus and ind- indigenous centric focus, and you know our researchers who do indigenous work getting more recognised, uh, you know indigenous staff getting promoted and in good positions and doing good work. All of that is encouraging. All of that's encouraging. But then you kind of see, see the university kind of, you know, co opt the decolonising for its own, you know, uh, its own recruitment agenda. You know, it's, I'm well aware of the fact the university advertises how many black staff it has to. Gr- to both recruit more black staff and to recruit students, it's a very it's very transparent what they're doing with that. It's not it's not a secret. It's not it's not, it's not hidden as to why they like that. You know they they know it encourages students to come here, and that's not a bad thing in in, in one sense of you know you want more students of color to come here. So showing them how many students of how many staff of color they have already is a good thing. But also you know they're not doing that for our benefit. They're doing it for their own benefit. They're doing it to get cash. You know, and again, the university's decolonial efforts often are focused, often do focus around money and, you know, what research funding we're getting. You know, Indigenous researchers, I heard a comment from someone, not at this university, but another university once say, Indigenous researchers are better because we have access to two pools of ARC funding. That was the reason we were better. <laughs> like, not because we're better researchers or because we bring different perspectives or because we, you know, challenge the the conceptions of a university and, a, and the conceptions of teaching. No, no, we have access to two pools of money, so we're better. <laughs> we can we can get double funding because we can get regular ARC funding and we can get, you know, indigenous funding. Like, there's two pools of money there. And I'm like, oh, that's, I guess that's a good, I guess, you know, if that means you're going to hire more of us, I guess that's good, but also, like, it's also not the reason you should be hiring us. Like, I, you shouldn't be hiring me because I come with money. Like, it's, you know, you should be hiring me because I'm a good, I'm a good person. I'm a good academic. I'm a good researcher. Like, if you're going to hire me for anything, like, you know, hire me for my my skills as an academic and as a person. Like, yeah, it's it's a bit like I'd almost prefer them to be like, oh, you know, James, you make good cookies for the office. Like, sure. Like, that's a that's a reason I could at least that's a selfish reason I could at least get behind. Because I, I do make good cookies. I am a good baker. I'm happy to be happy for a job to be like, yeah, you made a good bunt cake. We hired you for that. Like, cool. On board with that level of selfishness. But when it's like, oh, we can get more funding for our, our, our STEM programs, even though you teach in IR because you work here, I'm like, that's not a reason to hire me. <laughs> like, uh, it's like, a statement on how fucked up the academy is at the moment. Yeah, like it? the fact that the university having me here gets, gets them more overall funding which is that going to go to IR? No, it's going to go to giving a new science building. Not not ANU. I can't speak to ANU, but other. I've been speaking to other universities here that I've worked at before. Just yeah, it's like the fact. Like I don't care how many buildings the engineering department has. I don't use them. <laughs> don't go in there. But yes, my being here gives them that money. In my being here as a student gives them that money. My being here as a staff member gives them that money because because they get more recruitment value out of having black people here. So they get more money to spend, not on me, but on. <laughs> but to be fair, there are some universities doing really good things. You know, the scheme that I'm on at the ANU is fantastic in terms of the PhD work split. Uh, the ANU's got really good indigenous scholarships currently and upcoming. You know, they've got a lot of, a lot of money for that. Um, so, you know, there are good things in terms of decolonizing. I think the thing we have to think about there when we're decolonizing is what is the purpose for which we're doing it? Who are we doing it for? And that, that can be a contentious question. I think some people think it's good regardless of the reason. 
you know, and I don't, I, I used to hold that view. I used to hold the view, I think, of decolonizing is good regardless of why. I think the more I've been in the academy, the more I've come to the realization that, no, no, the intention of it does matter. The intention, whether the effect can be decolonial, but if the intention is not decolonial, then is it as effective? Is it the kind of decolonizing that we want? You know, there's a good article by Tuck and Yang from about 2012, so, you know, 10 years ago now, you know, you know, in, entitled, you know, decolonization is not a metaphor, right? And it's not a metaphor. It is a tangible thing. It's a thing that actually has active consequences. And so I think that's the thing that, you know, both gives me hope in some centers in university where you do see p- people doing it for the right reasons, but also reminds me what to be watchful for, which is what is the reason? Because if the reason, if the, if the if the impetus is wrong, then you are going to get metaphorical decolonizing rather than tangible work, which I think is more what we want to be seeing. And that's what led me to bring this back full circle. That's what's led me back to this kind of view of I don't think it's possible. I don't think we can have. I don't think it's possible to fully decolonize in a tangible way a, a university. You can get a fair way of the way there, and you can get a you can get all the way there metaphorically. But I don't think. If we're aiming for that kind of Tuck and Yang actual decolonizing, actual dismantling of systems, I'm not sure that's possible. But I think we can come a lot of the way there. I think we can improve, still improve the situation in terms of teaching, student experience, research, admin, all of the areas in which our students and our staff and our research interacts with. But are we going to get all the way there? I have to say uh, pessimistically, no. But I will say this, if I'm proven wrong in 20, 30, 40 years, I will happily eat my words. <laughs> I will happily admit that I was wrong and hap- happily do so in the same way that, like, I always make, I used to make the joke of, you know, I'm the only indigenous person in IR, but I would happily be proven wrong. And this year was happily proven wrong. Like, I made the joke for a couple of years and was I finally met some other people who were hiding in the woodworks up in Queensland up at Griffith. And so it's kind of nice. So this is one of those things where I'm, again, happily be proven wrong. If in 30 years, you know, if, you know, when you're retired and I'm still here and we're finally decolonized, I'll happily come up and give a speech or do a podcast with you, you know, and go, Ben, I was wrong. We did decolonize. We did it. You know, but I'll bring a cake and everything. Well, but by that time, we'll be podcasting directly into the brain. So. <laughs> but uh, now you make, you make some good points. There are big obstacles to this project. I mean, if it's just done to tick a bureaucratic box in a process, well, that's just reinforcing the old system. It's not decolonizing. Exactly. Yeah. If it's just to create a brand proposition, that's reinforcing the old system and it's not decolonizing. So, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm familiar with the, the decolonizing is not a metaphor article. It's a... Yeah, I, 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 prescribe it to, I prescribe it in every class I teach mm. because it's, it's one of those... It's one of those rare articles that I think is a central reading for everybody in a, in a, in a university. That and uh, Linda Tuwai Smith's uh, decolonizing methodologies. Mm. If I could prescribe one book to any, every one of my colleagues and every one of my students, it would be that. I actually had to buy a second copy recently because the first one was falling apart. <laughs> so I had to go buy a second copy of it. But yeah, I think yeah, the, both those two books I think speak to this kind of this kind of thing of it needs to be sy- systemic dismantling rather than ephemeral, you know, reinforcing of the current system. A related question, and this is something that I ponder from my own perspective as a, an autistic person and, and part of the neurodiversity movement, but for you as a First Nations scholar, what do you look for in a good ally within the academy? And on the flip side of that, what do you try to bring to your allyship with other people who are marginalised within the academy? Those are both fantastic questions. <laughs> uh, I think on the we'll start with the first one first. Um, I think in terms of what I look for in a good ally, I look for someone who prioritizes the First Nations voices over their own. So someone who's actually not just going, "Oh, I've read a lot about First Nations, I'm going to speak to them," but going, "No, no, you know, recognizing where they shouldn't speak and where they shouldn't platform themselves, and where they should instead actually give platforming to you know platform others, give." give space to First Nations people, give space to us to air our own issues. You know, folks who all, in, you know, who invite us to give guest lectures or invite us to, you know, have had colleagues who've actually gone, you know, look, I can't teach this course anymore. We have people who can do that better than me. We'll hand it over, you know. And you can compare it to kind of bad allies, you know, allies who like 
do platform themselves over others. You know, I can think of a particular example from Innovation Day this year where, you know, a very senior academic in my in the public policy space, you know, tweeting about their own personal fundraisers on Innovation Day for their own personal causes. And compared it to other colleagues I know who are actually giving over their Twitter handles to First Nations people in the activist community going, no, no, you know, I've got 15,000 followers, but I'm going to give it over to this person to raise the issue. That's the kind of behavior, I think, the latter there, not the former. You know, I don't, I don't want to read about, you know, your personal white lady fundraiser on Invasion Day, <laughs> frankly. But, you know, in terms of the latter, like, you know, going, you know, where is it I can make space? Where is it I can create a platform? I can create room for First Nations within my own work, within my own department, whatever that looks like in the time, you know, in, in the same way of like, you know, in, to kind of follow on from that, you know, it's also about recognizing where they shouldn't speak, you know, recognizing where their space isn't. Uh, I think also recognizing where their space is to speak as an ally, you know, where is it that sometimes white voices do carry more of an impact? So where is it as a white person that you actually do step up and you do intervene and you do say something? And you do do something, you know, there's that, there's that quote from John Lewis, you know, um, create good trouble, you know, whereas as a white person, you create good trouble, whereas as a white person, you go, actually, no, I need to cede the space here to First Nations to speak, or I need to cede the space here to First Nations to, to be involved in their own way. Like, that's like, it's them, it's, they need to be leading this. I think that's what I look for most in a good ally within an academic department, especially is, you know, where is it they are willing to cede their own space, especially when it doesn't do them any favours to do so. You know, where is it that I, I had a colleague once who was invited onto a TV program to speak of First Nations issues, and they actually went, no, I'm I'm not going to. You know, I'm going to cede it to over, uh, they gave me the slot. I've had co- other colleagues who've actually, you know, turned down paid gigs to run events. Like, you've been asked to speak at an event paid on Indigenous issues, and they've actually said to me, no, no, you know, they've turned down cash. They've turned down, you know, cold hard money to another group to First Nations folk to kind of give our platforms and give our voices more, more airing. So, you know, that's the kind of thing I look for is, you know, where people are doing that, even when it doesn't benefit them, you know, when they're either losing money, losing airtime, losing, you know, losing co-authorship on the, on the article, they feel they're not as good, you know, better place to not be writing it. I, I apply it to myself as well with other marginalized communities. You know, I'm always looking to go, you know, where is it my place to speak? Where is it my place to say something here? Where is it actually I should be platforming others? Where is, but also, you know, but also me going, you know, who are the voices in that community? Who is it I should be platforming? Who is it online or in person that I should be, I should be, you know, reaching out to and going, you know, I have this thing, I have this opportunity for you to speak, whether it be, you know, LGBTQIA plus or whether it be neurodivergent people or chronically ill people or the, you know, disabled people or whatever that, whatever marginalized group happens to be the format that I'm talking about. You know, I, I look to do to other marginalized groups, you know, what I wish white allies would do to me, right? And I think that's the kind of, you know, you know, kind of copying the behavior I want to see for myself in other groups. I think that's always been my approach, but also I think it's also about that solidarity, you know, as a marginalized person, as a First Nations person, it's about standing with other marginalized groups, whether they be disabled people or LGBTQIA people or women or or, um, you know, Palestinian refugees or, you know, all kinds, you know, other refugees, all kinds of, you know, all those other groups of, of people. Actually, that's a, that's a really good segue to a, a question about media. Oh, media. <laughs> so you're on ABC TV on the drum last week, and I think you've done some other TV gigs in the past, yeah. if that's correct, yeah. uh, as an expert guest. Now, I'm someone who has an inglorious history as an on-screen television interviewee. And I'm interested in how colleagues like yourself find the experience. So, you know, what was it like being on set or staring down the barrel of a camera for a re- uh, remote interview? What's your process for preparation? How do you handle yourself in the moment? Yeah. I mean, first of all, I love doing media, whether it be written or radio or TV. I think I prefer radio slash podcasts because I'm not having to worry about too much about what my face is doing or what my body is doing or you know, <laughs> all that kind of stuff. I don't, like I've rocked up to radio in, in you know, very, uh, very unkempt beach clothes. So, you know, like you don't have to care as much about appearance. I can just focus on what I'm saying. I do prefer the less visual mediums. I don't want I love TV. Um, I think in terms of, you know, yeah, I really enjoy it. I think because I'm very chatty, as you probably discovered over the last <laughs> little while, I can talk 
quite a bit. It's, and, that's, and I'm someone who's very passionate about the work that I'm doing. And so I think those two things blend together quite nicely for media in terms of I'm very passionate about what I'm talking about and I'm very eager to talk about it all. Uh, in terms of preparation, yeah, look, I think the more of it I do, the less I prepare. <laughs> it's this kind of inverse inverse function of the less media I do, <laughs> the more I prepare for it, then the more I do, the less I'm preparing because you kind of get used to the rhythm of it. You kind of get used to the rhythm of rhythm of radio, the rhythm, rhythm of TV, the, uh, the drama especially, you know, been on the drum, you know, a half dozen, maybe 10 times now. I think. And so the more of it I do, the less I feel like I need to actually prepare for the physicality of the show. I know what I'm doing. I know where I'm going. I know how it works. Obviously, I prepare for the topics, you know, whatever comes up on the day. You know, they do tell you on the day what's coming up. I send you articles and, and, and you know, like you did with this, you know, send articles and topics and questions and things. And most TV, if it's pre-recorded, which the drum is pre-recorded, a little inside a trick, it's, re- it's recorded five to six, airs six to seven. So it airs live, but it's pre-recorded. Um, so they tend to give you a little bit of a phone call a couple hours before to kind of run you through some of the stuff and to kind of also to get a gauge of what it is I'm going to say. They kind of like to know what it is my views are. So they they can both tailor questions to me, but also kind of if someone else says something that they know I'm going to want to talk about, the host can kind of pivot to me and go, oh, I know James wants to talk a lot about X, Y, Z. You know, if, if it comes up, if Uluru comes up, they tend to pivot to me a bit because they know I can talk about Uluru and I'm a member of the dialogue and everything. So, you know, that, that kind of stuff. Um, but, yeah, I mean, in terms of prep work, like say, say for the drum, I just, you usually start prepping about an hour before the phone call with them. Like an hour before I get to the phone call, I'll do a bit of reading, a bit of reading up, have that phone call, about 45 minutes, and then I won't think about it again until the show. I completely switch off until the show starts. And then they kind of hit you with the questions and I'm just kind of relying on my memory of what I said of what I said an hour ago, uh, two hours ago, three hours ago to get me through. Sometimes though when I'm on the phone call with them, I do sort of catch myself saying very witty things or very kind of a you know, bit of a zinger. And I do write those down. So I do write on a little post-it note any like terribly funny things that I've accidentally said the first time and that the producer laughed at and then I'll write them down and I'll sit on the studio like just they're there. I'll read them before I go in. I know they're there, and I can kind of remember what they are. And kind of you know, like one of the ones I said famously was, um, you know, Trump took a dump on democracy. Another was I said, you know, um, uh, calling Trump an effective, effective diplomat is like calling a tsunami a choppy, a choppy swell. You know, like things like that that are funny, that are off the cuff comments that I've just kind of you know plucked out of thin air. That I do, I do try and remember those and write those down a bit so I can kind of. <laughs> kind of keep them on hand in case that same question comes up in the program and I can kind of bring it up and look funnier on TV than I normally would be otherwise. Live, oh, live interviews are harder, I think, because you don't have time to prepare. It's just you're on air and you've got to talk and go for it. But, again, I think be- being very chatty helps a bit because I come used to talking endlessly at length. So I think I, colleagues I know who don't like doing TV are those who are generally a bit quieter and a bit less kind of extroverted <laughs> i think those are a little bit shyer on tv although i do say one the more you do oh, sorry i'm not in my code i do say that the more you do the more you enjoy it like i enjoyed it the first time i enjoyed it even more now but mm. am i going to become a journalist or a tv personality <laughs> hell no <laughs> but i like being a guest <laughs> yeah and you do it well and you do it well <laughs> Thank love the uh the translation of your saturday dad jokes from twitter into the <laughs> Into the yes, TV my, set, my weekly post on Twitter of a bad joke to <laughs> to TV. I mean, I am filled with dad jokes. I think people don't realize that about me. I am. I'm not plucking these out of like I'm not googling it. I'm plucking these out of my out of my head. Like my brain is like thirty percent work, fifty percent bad dad jokes, and twenty percent Lord of the Rings. Like that's all the that's all that's in there, and the occasional frog fact. <laughs> <laughs> I wholeheartedly endorse the Lord of the Rings and the Star Wars references that have cropped into yes, Star Wars references, of course. Yes, I, you probably noticed that the podcast that I have been popping in a lot of Star Wars, Lord of the Rings references. Yeah. I make no apologies for them. Love it, love it. Uh, but on the social media, you know, as someone who's a, a vocal advocate for First Nations issues and, and for other marginalised communities as well, Twitter can be an absolute shit dump. <laughs> Of abuse, and it can also be a really, yeah, really liberating place where you can find community. How have you found 
being a uh, you know a significant voice in Twitter and social media. Uh, exactly the way you described. I mean, it's both a toxic cesspool, and calling it a toxic cesspool is unfair to hardworking toxic cesspools in our society. You know, <laughs> the comparison with Twitter is not welcome from them. But it's also it is a place of good community. I think it, it is that mixed bag. It's a fine balance. You know, I've gone from really I've met some really wonderful friends and colleagues and you know lifelong friends from Twitter you know, who I've met from interaction on there, who I now am really, really close with. I've also received death threats from from Twitter and through Twitter. And so, you know, you it's equal bag. You know, I've met lifelong friends who I'm probably going to have in my wedding party, the people who I'm going to like, you know, who have threatened me, who threatened to kill me, right? So it's like very, very different, very polar opposite. I think it, it, it is very polar in terms of the experience. There is no middle of the road Twitter. You're either having an amazing day or a terrible day on Twitter. There is no in between. I do like Blackfella Twitter, you know, hashtag Blackfella Twitter. Um, it's a great community place, a great place for discussion. Whitefella Twitter is also equally fine, you know. One of my whitefellas on Twitter are mostly Americans because I, you know, follow American politics. But, um, yeah, I think the one thing I found about Twitter is, you know, obviously you can't convey nuance in 280 characters. It's very hard to do. It's very easy for people, myself included, to sort of take offense at things that necessarily weren't meant to be offensive or for people to get a very antagonistic tone. And there's black fellas and white fellas alike. You know, there's good good people on Twitter and bad people on Twitter and folks who have good days and bad days. I've, I've said shitty things on Twitter and gotten in trouble for them and vice versa. I'm sure you have as well. I'm sure everyone who here oh, yeah, who has who's listening who has Twitter has insulted somebody or, you know, said something horribly offensive to someone else on Twitter and we've all done it and we apologize for them and delete them. Some obviously, some folks like to double down. There's always that person who likes to double down on the insult, double down on the threat. You know, there's those, there's those folks. You know, some folks, a former colleague, who they've since left left academia, but you know, you know, who was you know called out someone for being racist, and then they doubled down on the racism, <laughs> and was like, oh, you know, what did they, what did they say? I remember them saying something, something like, oh, it wasn't racism because I didn't think it was. It's like, oh, cool, white people don't get to pick what racism is. You know, there's always that person who doubles down on Twitter and stuff. But I don't know, yeah, it's a good place to build community. I think it's also a good place for academics to connect. A lot of academics are on there. I find there is a big difference between Australian Twitter and American Twitter, though. Australian Twitter is very professional. There's academics, there's journalists, there's politicians, there's, you know, uh, quote-unquote serious people on Australian Twitter. Then you've got American Twitter, and it's just every man and their dog is on American Twitter, every regular random person on Twitter over there. There's a very different vibe to American Twitter where you've got just regular people who are big on Twitter. And here it's like, no, no, you're an academic, you're a journalist, you're a, you're a you know, celebrity or whatever. You know, you're Adam Liao, you know, sharing recipes or, you know, you're Osman Faruqi or Ben Habib or, you know, someone like, or, you know, Chelsea Watergo, who's an amazing scholar who's on there, not on there anymore, but, you know, who's, who used to be on there. You know, so like that's the kind of mix. Australia is much more professional and serious and, it still can be as scummy and as sludge pity, but it's it's just more serious people saying ruder things. <laughs> but there are, you know, there are really great academic things. I've found some really great, you know, things to read and articles to read from people who have shared them on Twitter with me. You know, I've networked net, net with academics who are uncontactable by an email. <laughs> it's always weird to be the academic who can never answer an email, but will respond to a Twitter DM instantly. I mean, I am that person, so don't. <laughs> I say it's weird, but that's also me, you know. Send me a tweet, DM. Don't send me an email. It's quicker. <laughs> but yeah, no, I, 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 I love and hate Twitter. I go off and on. It's like sometimes, like right now, I'm really on Twitter, and then often during the summer, I turn off. Often December, January, I kind of shut down the Twitter and sort of wind it down a bit, you know, go on vacation and you know enjoy my life. Yes, sagely advice. <laughs> Unplug from it from time to time. Yeah. Well, having said that, it was on Twitter where I discovered one of our personal connections in that uh, you were very proudly talking about uh, being a student in the Wiradjuri language course at Charles mm. State University. And my partner's mother, Patina Love, has taught into that course. Uh, and mm. I believe you know of Patina through, through that connection there. But just in terms of, of being able to learn Wiradjuri language, you know, what does that mean to you and, and the, the, the broader significance of language reclamation? Yeah, look, I've talked before many times on, on the radio as well about how much I value that course and how amazing that course is. And I cannot praise it enough and cannot praise Uncle Stan Grant Sr. and 
Letitia Harris and Professor Stuart Green at CSU for the amazing work they do in that course. I just have to give them a, a very personal and public shout out for that course because it is amazing and the work they put in is fantastic. Yeah, the, the course means so much. I mean, the ability to, you know, someone who didn't grow up learning language and whose grandmother didn't speak much, if any, language and, you know, all that stuff to kind of go from that into, into being able to learn my language again or, you know, as the way they put it in the course, we're not learning it, we're remembering our language, you know, we're reclaiming it for ourselves is, is thrilling and amazing and a very emotional experience. It's a very, you know, it's taught intensively. So you go in blocks of, of weeks, you go out to Wagga Wagga and learn the language and it's very immersive and, you know, based on, you don't, you're not there to learn grammar, you're there, there to learn how to speak it. And through that, you learn the grammar, but you're there, it's very, you know, very immersive. It's, it's, it's a very heavy week. You come back, you know, you come back at the end of, end of every day exhausted and all you've done is sit down and speak for a couple of hours and you're just like, you know, yeah, you've done done a nine to five day in the ch- in a chair, you know, <laughs> having a yarn for a whole day, but you come back and you're just dead. But I find coming back from the whole week, you know, you do a whole week there and you come back to your regular life, I've, I invigorated, absolutely invigorated. You're there on country, learning language with elders and community and cousins and family and people who are going to be lifelong family and friends there, and it's just wonderful. It's really wonderful and. The way the course is developed, you know, it's done over two years. You do one subject a semester. You know, it's all it's all been crafted in a way that's really meant to encourage the learning and the development of our language skills and our cultural connections. And actually, too, it's not 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 just language learning; it's culture, it's heritage, it's it's really kind of building us up as Wurundjeri people, and really, yeah, really building us up as a nation. Um, and so, yeah, I think the course is invaluable to that and invaluable to our culture and our heritage and obviously our language and our co- invaluable to our country. It's doing Rotary country a great service, that course. And I'm so glad it exists at CSU in the form that it does. I'm so grateful to, you know, to all those involved in teaching it and developing it and past students that have gone before. Now, that being said, there is some talk afoot at CSU of radically revamping the way they, that course is run in terms of the way the students are dealt with and the way the, the kind of the course is funded and the way the funding goes out to the, to the students of the course and the way the students are hosted by CSU. And I'd be remiss in not critiquing them for that uh, here on this platform, given you've given the opportunity to do so. Um, but yeah, I'd be remiss in saying that the proposed changes to the Rotary Language Graduate Certificate at Charles Sturt University, especially uh, the away from base supports uh, are atrociously horrible to put it mildly absolutely fundamentally missing the point of the course i think and so that's the thing about but that brings us back to the, this whole de- decolonial thing right like if it's left to the university admin they're going to fuck it up if it's left to them they're going to absolutely not get the point and you can see it here with charles Sturt. the administration of the university has decided that for whatever reason they need to save money on this course of all courses and they need to make us the scapegoat for campus life revitalization. Why? And to do that, they're going to absolutely gut the way the course is run. The course is run in not the content, but just the way the course is, the way the students are supported through the course. And I'm give, give, give me an opening to attack them for a bit. So I'm going to do that just so I can, it's on air and I can send them a link and go listen to the podcast and hear me attack you. Because it is, it is a fundamental misunderstanding of, of the course. You know, because the students, Aboriginal students are supported this course through funding for accommodation, funding for meal allowances, funding for, you know, travel allowances. And the changes, the changes they're proposing for that, it's, you know, the, it's a return to mission days, you know, ration cards and things. You know, they're going to supply our own food and, you know, all that other kind of stuff. It's terrible stuff. But just, you know, had to, had to give that a little plug for a bit about that. Because the course is so wonderful and the course is so, I found it life-changing. Absolutely, I would encourage every graduate person in my life and have done to enroll in the course, to sign up for the course. I've been teaching my sister and my girlfriend, you know, different phrases in language and different, you know, words in language. And I've been teaching other people, you know, my nan's learned a little bit, you know, she can say hello and thank you now. (laughs) And just the look of joy on my sister's face and other people's faces when you kind of, you are speaking them in language. It's equal to the joy I get in speaking it, you know. I think that's the big thing about language reclamation too is, you know, speaking a language that was for so long not just denied but deprived of us, forced out of us, you know. People were arrested, sent to jail for speaking language. People were, you know, severely punished and beaten for speaking language publicly. 
to the ability that I can now, you know, a year into this two year process, a year and a bit, I can now speak my language in a way that others couldn't, and in formats and venues that others weren't allowed to, is such a joy. I think that's true of all, you know, Indigenous peoples who are relearning and reclaiming language is that it is such a joy to be able to speak that. And it's also part of country. You know, we are rebuilding our connection to, you know, we are of, you know, we are of Radjuri country. Our language is also of Radjuri country. That is the language of that place. And so being able to go on country and speak that language is invigorating for us and for the country. And yeah, it's absolutely, it's, it's, I cannot praise that course and its administrators enough and cannot praise the current formatting, which is currently delivered, if not the future proposed format from CSU. Mm. Oh, that's so wonderful to hear, like how life-changing that course has been. Oh, it is. Yeah. To call that life change, to call, to call this Charles Sturt University Graduate Certificate in Radio Language, Heritage and Culture, to call that life-changing is an understatement, absolute understatement. It is beyond life-changing. All right, let's finish off by zooming back out to... Uh, <laughs> U.S. politics and Australian foreign policy. <laughs> Zooming back out, oh, God. <laughs> September last year, we had the AUKUS announcement of this new agreement between the U.S., Britain and Australia for Australia to purchase some nuclear-powered submarines with other collaborations around science and technology sharing. Now, my unintellectual initial reaction was a letdown that they should just... I wanted them to announce the fucking aliens instead. <laughs> <laughs> but, but instead, we got a submarine announcement. But in all seriousness, there, there's a lot to unpack with this. What was your initial reaction to AUKUS? Uh, I'm going to upset a lot of people in IR, but I was like, I don't give a fuck. <laughs> I didn't give a fuck. I genuinely couldn't, couldn't, you couldn't rub two brain cells together to care. Like both, it seemed so unnecessary, all the hype, and then all the talk since about, how amazing AUKUS is. I'm like, cool, I guess. I don't care. Moving on. Like, just, I just don't care. <laughs> like, I just, and then the second thing was like, so like, when are we going to get the subs then? Like, we had subs for 2040, now it's 2060. Like, are we ever, it's like never ending story of the subs. Like, we, I feel like Australia's in this cycle of we announce subs, we build, we start building subs, we then scrap the subs and announce new subs again. Like, I've had subway orders take less time <laughs> than, than the process to get submarines for Australia. And that's also part of my apathy is just like, it's just this endless saga of white Anglo men in defence and security in Australia telling us how essential it is that we have submarines and tanks and planes. Not, not really explaining why they're essential, other than just to kind of wave in the air and go, uh, China. And then go, we need subs, uh, China. That's not a reason. <laughs> That's not a reason. <laughs> That's not a reason for anything. It's like me going, oh, I'm going out for, you know, going out for dinner tonight. Oh, why? Uh, food? Like, <laughs> that's not a reason. <laughs> go Waving your hand and going, a oh, Chinese strategic competition. It's like that scene from Utopia, right? Like, we're protecting our trade route with, trade route with China from China. Like, just what the fuck? Like, so when the AUKUS stuff comes out, I just, I, I, I don't have the energy to care. Like, I just, and that's my AUKUS, AUKUS summary is, can people stop presuming because I'm in IR, I care about AUKUS and I care about China because I care about neither. And st- <laughs> like, <laughs> well, in that vein, let me share. I did a word association when I was reading the announcement because I was similarly not that impressed by it. Uh, so first reaction was military industrial complex doing military industrial complexy things. Bath toys for bomb fondlers. <laughs> Last ride of the Anglo Imperials. <laughs> Winner announced for containment naming contest. <laughs> and tomorrow when the hegemonic transition began. It's just white Anglo supremacy again. With with toy, it's just boys and their toys, right? And it's and then afterwards, after we got the subs, we got tanks. Someone made a joke. I forget who it was. It was like we got subs that people can't go in, and tanks that fish can't go in. <laughs> like, but this really speaks to because you you did some writing, I think, with Kate Clayton about yes. the attitudes of young Australians to foreign affairs. 
And I think AUKUS really illustrates this disconnect between where foreign policy world is at and where young people in particular and the broader Australian public are at with foreign uh, yeah. policy. Would you, I remember writing that with Kate. Yeah, yeah, that was a really good piece. Um, yeah, I think there's a real big disconnect between the Australian people and young people around these issues. And tell me one person on the street who knows what AUKUS is and tell, can tell you why it's important. And the foreign policy sort of academic defence department sort of circle jerk. <laughs> Excuse my language. Like, take this one. The one I, I love the most is the phrase uh, Indo-Pacific, which for those who don't know or those who do know, uh, is a meaningless jargon phrase that was made up. It's a made-up nonsense phrase just to annoy China. That is the only reason people use it. It's a made-up nonsense phrase to annoy China and make India feel special. It's a nonsense phrase. The Australian foreign policy apparatus, I suppose, and the events department apparatus views the use of Indo-Pacific as like the you, you know, like a like a sacred cow. You must not question it. You must always use Indo-Pacific. It's the phrase we must use. We must make sure we China unhappy. Lowy did the poll on it on which which phrasing Australians prefer. It is the least favorable of all of them. <laughs> Outside of like stupid ones like Oceania. Like, like, compare, like between Asia, Asia Pacific, which was the term we all used for decades previously, and Indo Pacific, no one under sixty uses Indo Pacific, and no one, I'm sure, had, and I'm sure all those over sixty year olds are all working in the National Security College here at the ANU. <laughs> That's the entire cohort of people that use that phrase because they're all white men over sixty with beards. No offense to those men with uh, 60 with beards. I, I have a beard myself, but that like, doesn't make you doesn't make you smart. But like just the fact, like that's an example, along with AUKUS, of this kind of disconnect between the foreign policy intelligentsia and everyday regular people. And I know I'm not an everyday regular person. I'm an IR academic, and that's fair. But just this idea that we must, you know, we've got to have AUKUS to get nuclear submarines to Canada, China, and the Indo Pacific. That's a nonsense phrase. That's a nonsense phrase. It's I could talk about Keller Brimbor defeating a Balrog at the at the fall of you know at the fall of Gondolin. That phrase makes more sense than than the phrase about orcas in China and Indo Pacific. Indo Pacific is not a thing that exists. Mm. But anyway, that's my Indo Pacific rant done for the day. Yeah, well, there's nothing about the precision of talking about a geographic area that takes up half the earth, but that's another. Oh, someone, that's another story. Oh, someone, oh, I saw this. Oh God, it was terrible. Someone on Twitter put uh, was the Southern Indo-Pacific to include the Southern Ocean. And I was like, why or the Arctic Indo-Pacific? And I was like, why not just go the Arctic, Antarctic, Atlantic, Indo-Pacific? Like, why don't you just go all of them? Yeah, so just all name all the oceans. All this, the, the oceans, just the oceans. Like it just where does it stop? Like, where does it stop? It's like people who want to add Japan to to, to AUKUS and, and Indonesia. It's like well, just that's the UN. Like, that's the UN. Everyone. Yeah. I wouldn't mind them adding Japan and Indonesia to AUKUS or Japan and India to AUKUS for only for one reason. Because then we could call it Jacuzzi. <laughs> J-A-K-A-U-S-I. Jacuzzi. I'm in favour of that. <laughs> oh. But I guess the, the main game, of course, is climate change. And that's something that young people care clearly- a lot about. Uh, a lot about. Angsty about, yeah, and rightly so because it's that's the thing that's shaping. We all care about, and yeah, yet government and higher academia seems well behind in terms of climate security and climate change as a security issue and as an international relations issue. It's like we're, we're living in the eighties still. Yeah, get with the program, people. There's a bigger game going on. All right, last question. Ooh, final question. <laughs> and the U.S. politics question. So I remember in the lead up to the 2020 US presidential election, the International Crisis Group published a crisis bulletin warning about the risk of violence around the election and the fragility of US democracy. So this was extraordinary because usually ICG publishes reports about fragile states elsewhere in the world. This time they're publishing a crisis bulletin about the imperial core. <laughs> so it's hard to ignore that the US is facing some kind of existential moment. So as someone who's been a long time observer and analyst of US politics, what are you seeing playing out? What are you seeing coming with the, the midterm elections and the 2024 I'm, presidential what, what, elections? What am I seeing now? An absolute backslide into anti democracy. 
the Republican Party has given up on democracy completely at every level, from a federal level, where they're censoring Liz Cheney for supporting the January 6th commission into the riots at the Capitol, to a state level where Trump is trying to primary out all of the elections officials in all the various states that didn't certify his, his uh, false win. You know, he's primarying Brad Raffensperger in Georgia, right? You know, um, to the local level where local Republicans are banning books and banning the teaching of the Holocaust and the civil rights movement and everything else. America is backsliding into, into an illiberal anti-democracy. Absolutely. You can see it playing in real time. And the frustrating bit is not that that's happening, although that is frustrating, is that the Democratic Party, the one remaining party of governance and democracy, seems to not be taking it as seriously as they ought to. It's a crisis, not some sad moment where they wish they could have better governing partners. It's just a serious crisis. What I see happening in 2022, uh, furtherment of that. Republicans will probably retake the House, maybe the Senate, which then therefore means nothing will get done for two years. Uh, in 2024, Joe Biden may win again. Trump, Trump will claim he won, though. And chaos. I'm going to make a prediction now, which I'm terrified of making, but I'm going to make it, anyway. going to make it anyway. The next Democratic president who wins when the Republicans control Congress will not be allowed to be sworn in. You saw it in 2020, and the Republican Party has moved even further to that extreme of Democrats can't win elections. It seems to be the new Republican Party platform is Democrats can't win elections. So, yeah, I'm terrified for America, absolutely terrified they are backsliding into a, into a dictatorship, and it could easily happen if Trump wins again, this kind of return to kind of move to mob rule, this move to, no, it's moved to minority rule, actually, because it's not it's, not the mob, it's the minority. You <laughs> move to minority control of government. It terrifies me and depresses me. And I am not sure what anyone can do about it, sort of, you know, giving the Democrats a serious kick up the ass. And of course, in the event that such a coup is successful, that has implications for every other country that relates to the US in any way. Absolutely, including, including allies. Yeah. So, like our RMIT colleague Emma Shortus wrote a, yes. an article earlier this year about what this might mean for Australia and what our contingencies are in the event that yeah. this happens. Also, also, you should also people should go read her book, mm. An Unexceptional Friend, right, on the same on this very topic. You know why Australia is so closely bound with the US? Yeah, no, it's 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 a concern for us. It's a concern for Europe. It's a great boon for China and Russia, of course. You know they they'll benefit out of it as as will every tin pot dictator and terrorist the world over. But yeah, no, it's not a good thing. Well, on that note, let's draw this to a close. We've had a cracking... what a happy note. What a happy note to end on. <laughs> <laughs> but James, thanks so much for joining us at the Edge Dwellers Cafe. It was a great yarn. Thanks for having me. It was wonderful to be here. Dwellers Cafe. Yes, the man who turns dad jokes into rad jokes. Such an interesting yarn. Thank you, James Blackwell. I'm still laughing at all the gags and all the sci fi and fantasy references. Anything vaguely related to aliens, vampires, zombies, witches, and wizards gets two thumbs up from me. But jokes aside, if the colonial project is hitting the wall, then decolonization work can't be just a metaphor. That goes for people and organisations, right up to governments and even the international system itself. And that's the challenge, ultimately, that James Blackwell has thrown down to us in this episode. We covered a lot of ground in this discussion and referred to the work of a number of different people. I've linked to the work in the show notes of everyone and everything we cited here. All of these people are doing incredible work, so please do check out these links. A reminder also that you can support the Edge Dwellers Cafe podcast by clicking on the like and subscribe buttons on whatever platform you're listening on. And send through a dollar or two on Ko-Fi to help me cover the costs of putting this thing out there. All of that is so much appreciated. In a chaotic world, look to the edges for the most creative responses. Thanks as always for tuning in. This is Ben Habib signing off from the Edge Dwellers Cafe. Stay safe and much love.